All right, as you can see, UFC fighter Paige Van Zandt joins me now. Paige, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? Not too bad. It's your first time in Lisbon, I understand? This is my first time in Portugal altogether, and it's it's been pretty awesome, though, so far. Part of your honeymoon, you were just saying, which is pretty cool. Kind of. We're making it, trying to make it a honeymoon-ish. <laughs> he fought right after our wedding, and then I've been traveling since then, so we're going to try to, like, sight see while we're here, and then we both jump into a fight camp when we get back. Yeah, so I understand. Well, congratulations on everything. And, Thank you. Uh, we, we'll chat about uh, your fight camp and your injury, because it was an yes. interesting one uh, very shortly. We, we should start with Web Summit. And yes, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're speaking at a number of different roundtables mm -hmm. and panels. The one that really stuck out to me is why can athletes brand themselves better than startups? Which is a great title for yep. any discussion. So tell me why. Why can uh, athletes brand themselves better than startups? Gosh, it's definitely an interesting question, especially um, because it is still hard to brand yourself being a professional athlete. Mm. Especially you don't want to kind of put yourself into a specific box within the industry that you're in. So a football player just being a football player or a fighter, me just putting myself into the box of a fighter. You have to find ways to make yourself known outside of just your small world. So I think it's, you know, in a sense easier for us because as fighters, because it is an individual sport. So we get to put ourselves forward. We get to put whoever we want to be at the forefront. We're not necessarily representing a team or representing a specific, um, number or having sure. to wear a football helmet so you can you can see exactly who we are and um i think it's easier as, as athletes is because there is so many more eyes on us people become fans and when you have fans you have those people that want to follow you and gravitate towards you whereas with startups it's not necessarily something that you have to actually work really work on selling yourself yeah it's very true when did you realize that you know, when I was asked the question, I kind of, um, when I was told that's kind of what I would be speaking upon in my round table, I went in and I really thought about, um, thought about it and why it is easier. And for me, I do have to focus so much on branding myself and making myself a brand and not mm -hmm. just a fighter. Mm -hmm. So when you get into the UFC, I presume that's something that's in your mind immediately that, you know, it's always been a part of the, the fight mm -hmm. game, really, the brand, but we're only really speaking about it in the last 10 years yep. uh, as such. Uh, like the, the brands of, like Muhammad Ali had a great brand. Yes. But mm -hmm. Maybe he didn't refer to it as a brand. Yes. Well, and I actually necessarily didn't didn't think of it when I first started in the UFC. It was after I was getting a name for myself and the media kind of brands you for you. And then you have to work on whether you like that stigma or who you want to be and put yourself forward. And that's something that I've done is I really am just true to myself. And I feel like that sells so much easier than trying to put on a facade or put on a character mm. it works for some athletes but in another sense it can feel very ingenuine sure. so um it's really about just putting your best self forward and showing off what you want the world to see do you have many discussions about your brand with ufc chiefs does dana white actively encourage people to get out there and push their own brand no i haven't had to i feel like i am so active on social media and i have a lot of fun um, showing off all the different things that I do outside of fighting, you know, being on Dancing with the Stars and writing a book. I have so many passions outside of fighting. Mm. It was kind of easy for me to do the cross promotion and then get on Dancing with the Stars and things like that. But I definitely know that there are other athletes a little, it's a little bit harder for. And it's something where finding what about you makes you special and that's going to sell to fans. Because at the end of the day, we are professional fighters, but it's still an entertainment industry. Yeah, for sure. And we can see that, like, when you look at someone like Conor McGregor, like he's exactly. a good fighter, but he, he was always helped by the fact that he was a great talker and his yes. brand helped mm -hmm. him climb that ladder. So like, it really is a question of how, what percentage would you place on your brand and what percentage would you place on your fighting ability? You obviously need to be an outstanding world-class fighter to be where you are. Mm -hmm but to actually stand out from the crowd because the differences are so tiny at that level yeah, of any sport. You have to find what makes yourself stand out. And that was the hard thing you see with somebody like Demetrius Johnson, who mm. was a multi-time champion, the most successful champion in the UFC, yet he didn't do that next step to brand himself. And that was, I think, where Connor, you know, stood out from the crowd. There's those few athletes that are, that make themselves known. And I think that's a whole other like champion mentality to make sure that the world knows who you are. And that's something so special that not a lot of people have. What's your unique brand? Gosh, my unique brand. I don't know. I think, um, I feel like I just put my best self forward and that's me sharing, you know, the pieces of my life that people don't necessarily, um, ask about or people that they don't necessarily know. So like being able to show, you know, my dance skills on Dancing with the Stars, being able to show that I cook too and be on Chopped. Yeah. and being able to differentiate myself than um, any other athlete in the UFC. 
So to show yourself as a human being and not just as an as a fighter. Exactly. Show that I'm a human and I'm not just a you know a tough person that gets locked in a cage and fights another person. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the one last thing I wanted to ask you about branding. It's quite an interesting topic, I guess, in this part of the world where football is the number one sport. Yes. And we've had this conversation quite a bit over the last couple of weeks when it comes to football clubs not signing a player based entirely on their Instagram followers, but it is suddenly mm -hmm. a part of modern football business. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that surprises you at all, where you look at somebody like Paul Pogba who plays Manchester United, and they, like there has been some suggestion that yeah. Manchester United were quite interested in the fact that he's got so many million followers on followers. Instagram. Yeah, I mean, in one way, you know, I, I do get it, but then the other sense, you know, it, you do have to have the skill to be a part of a team. And to be, be such a, like, a player in such a high level field, you still have to be an athlete first. And I think that that's the difference with like the UFC. I, they do sign people based on you know popularity, mm. but at the same time, you have to have the skill to back it up. Because at the same time, you're going in there and you're fighting somebody, or you're playing against somebody, and your skill should be first and foremost the most important thing. Sure, like I, I totally agree. But also, what I really like about the UFC is that. Like, as you say, they make no bones about it. It's like, fair enough, yes. you, you know, these are great fighters, but they're also great characters. There's yep. nothing wrong with that. Whereas some sports are like, hold on a minute, we're more upfront about this, then everybody can just kind of move forward a little bit and actually we can talk about branding in a much more sensible way than we already do. I think you guys in the UFC, and I think in the United States in general, are far more advanced than we are over here. I think we're, mm -hmm. we're quite conservative with, with some of our sports and how we approach athletes. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think that you have to understand like building a player and building the popularity between, behind one person is going to draw so much in, um, interest into the sport, into the team, and that's something that Connor did is, you know, we had a relatively small fan base within the UFC and then you have a personality and a brand like him that stands out and people gravitate and will be fans of MMA just because of him. Mm. So having those big personalities and those brandings, it, it helps... Um, the fellow teams and the fellow sport. Yeah, you mentioned Dancing with the Stars, you mentioned Chop there, you also mentioned your book which came out earlier this year. It's quite a, a tough read uh, mm -hmm. in some parts of it. What persuaded you or what kind of, uh, at what point did you decide that it was the right time for you to share with the world your story of, of your bullying and sexual assaults when yeah. you were younger? You know, for me, it, and I never necessarily knew when the right time would be, but I had quite a few people reach out to me on social media and say that they had gone through these instances. And if somebody that doesn't even know me can share and it, talk about how I inspired them, then I felt like it was my turn to like inspire people and share my story. And it, it really, I feel like I was put in the UFC for a reason and it's not, not I'm not meant and um, yeah it was a hard thing to, to share but it was a part of my life and I hope and it came out right around the Me Too movement and I felt it was a perfect time to kind of create that wave and um, hopefully create a lot of differences in like the world and um, especially with like the whole anti-bullying stigma going on right mm. now because that is so, so prevalent in our schools now more than ever yeah is that like when you talk about the Me Too movement there do you feel that it's something that's yet it's really penetrating sports I do. I mean, I feel like it's it's a hard topic in sports because especially when you have women athletes, we're already trying so hard to stand out as an athlete and then to actually have to go through something like that and make that well known or to draw light to it is really hard. So I feel like as women athletes, we already have so many like hurdles to jump and then on top of having something like that to get through, it can be really hard. So when you're putting pen to paper in the book, it's not just trying to recount extremely difficult experiences in your life. It's also trying to come to terms with the idea of how you might view it as being a female athlete talking about this sort of stuff. It definitely is. I mean, it definitely changes the way you're looked at forever. And that was one thing that I had to know. And even going back to like your brand, knowing that that could hurt my brand, it could hurt the way people view me. But it, I also had to understand my, my image is who I am and that's something that happened mm -hmm. to me. And I want my image to, uh, you know, to show the things that I've been through and the way that I've overcome and the way that I want to change women and the way we speak up and the way we share and to change bullying in schools and all those things to use my brand for that purpose. Yeah, how has the feedback been? Have you heard first person uh, narratives about how you've inspired different people? I definitely have. And you know, there's no matter what, you're gonna have those few negative voices, but there has been so many positive ones and to have so many people reach out and say, your story inspired me or to have people I've you know, been able to talk on the phone to different girls who have gone through similar things and help them get through a hard time or help them get through a trial that they're going through because of all of this. And to be able to you know, share and actually know that 
my voice was helping people makes you know makes me feel like me being in the UFC was even worth it. That's yeah. what it's all for. You speak like somebody who's over what happened. Uh, like I presume mm -hmm. it happened in your late teens. Yeah, uh huh. Like ten years ago. It, it's it, like it, it's remarkable that at the age of twenty four you were able to put pen to paper on that. Everybody recovers at different times, but did you feel over those ten years it was a, a constant recovery? For Maybe the process of actually putting it out into the open was a cathartic experience for you and that's actually helped the process. Um, it definitely was a very hard process to go through and uh, I feel like you never fully recover and you never are fully healed but things get easier and you're able to like accept what happened and not be, you know, feelings of resentment go fall to the past and it's something that you have to work on daily because going through any sort of traumatic experience it's always going to be in the back of your mind but I felt like that's why it was so important for me to share everything because I had so many you know young girls reach out and know that I had gone through something and I made it through I wanted to show them that there is a light of the tunnel you can be successful even though you went through something so hard. Do you think you had that innate strength at the time to help you get through it? No, and that was, you know, I needed somebody to talk to and I needed somebody to look up to and I didn't have my voice back then and I do have it now and I can use it to share. Yeah, well, absolutely. It's, it's a great platform and like, mm -hmm. completely for everybody using a platform like that to try and help people out in whatever situation they may be mm -hmm. in. Um, it's kind of a little bit more trivial, but I did want to talk to you about uh, your fighting career. Because yeah. I signed my fight contract, so oh, I'll be, I'll be fighting... Go. Uh, January 19th on the first ESPN card for the UFC. Right, nice one. That is going yeah. to be a big night for the UFC. It is a big night, so I'm very, very excited. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the injury. Uh, it, it's it's grueling enough details, but oh uh, my gosh, it was it was a tough one. Yeah, so I did a spinning back fist in my last fight, and I broke my ulna. If you can see my fun scar oh now. God. It's a really big one. So uh, I was supposed to have one surgery where they put a plate and a bunch of screws in, and that was supposed to fix it, and it was supposed to be ready to to like start training in th three months. Well, uh, six months went by and my arm was still totally broken. It had like 0% sign of healing, so it still just had a crack through my arm. So they had to take the old plate out, put a much bigger, stronger one in, and they took a bone graft from my hip, filled it, and then now we are three months past the second surgery, but uh, 10 months past the fight. So it's been... <laughs> Um, but yeah, things are um, awesome right now. I'm showing tons of progress in my arm and it should be cleared to 100% start training this month. Wow, that is incredible. So yeah. <laughs> you took a little bit of bone out of your hip to actually put into the bone? bone yeah, in so they went in and scraped off a bunch of bone from my hip and then they took platelets out of my hip to fill the crack. And then they put, it's like putting like live tissue where everything isn't, is dead. And so it's supposed to help it, you know, come back to life. Right, okay, that's incredible. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> that 10 months must have been tough. It's been a, you know, a very hard 10 months, um, but at the same time, I've had a lot of really exciting things happen. You know, I got married, which was awesome. Um, my husband's fighting career is taking off. I've been able to come to this, go through. Um, so it was, a, it was a, you know, a productive time off, but I definitely am very much itching to get back into the Your fighting career. Gosh, you know, um, as long as no injuries happen, which I can't guarantee, uh, I definitely want to fight. Try to get a few fights back to back within the UFC. So that's that's my goal. What would the UFC like during the injury? Actually, are they uh, were they happy to help out? Were they happy to kind of give you the reassurance that there will be another contract coming down the line? Um, you know, I still I'm, I'm in my fight contract right, right now with the UFC, so I knew that that the option for me to get back into the UFC once or once I knew I would have to get a fight contract whenever I was able. So. So we can, we can expect to see you back in January, but we can't announce the opponent just yet. When, when no, can we expect not the yet. <laughs> uh, soon, I hope. I'm waiting for the clearance from the UFC. Let's hope so. Well, Paige Van Zandt, it's been great to chat to you. Congratulations yeah, on all you. your successes and best of luck for the future. Mm -hmm, thank you so much. Impressive stuff there. Yeah, obviously at the end there, a horrific injury that she sustained uh, in her last fight. Uh, like, I'm not sure you can see the VT there, but a scar running all the way from here right the way through to the wrist. So... Um, being through the wars, I think uh, it's fair to say, but in the meantime, obviously, done quite a bit with her time from dancing with the stars to going on Chopped to writing a book. So she's made, uh, made the most of her injury. She's uh, made so money. Lots she, of money. She's made a lot of money, absolutely. Um, 
So, uh, like, uh, and she's obviously announced uh, her next fight as well, which uh, if you go onto her Instagram account, you'll be able to, to find that out. And you were saying that yesterday she announced after that interview that she's going to the WWE, or were you joking? Uh, so Stephanie McMahon was backstage having done her piece, and they, they missed each other. But we had David Meltzer on, who's like, um, he used to work for the super agent Lee Steinberg, who's the inspiration for Jerry Maguire. And on stage, like, it, it was a fairly obvious question. So, uh, Ronda Rousey made loads of money from, like, getting her head kicked in and was very famous. And now she's making loads of money not getting her head kicked in because wrestling's fixed. And uh, What? And so, brought this up. <laughs> Dave Meltzer was like, yeah, you got a meeting with her. I, I sorted it out. So, it was like, ah. Oh. It'll be a Lisbon, a little Lisbon marriage. Did you just reveal off the record information there, backstage information that wasn't in no, the public no, no. domain? No, I did it on stage yesterday. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, that, that would have been uh, awkward. At least we could have broke the story. 